Hello, I'm Charlie Allison. I have degrees in history, communications, and an MFA in creative writing. I have given papers on everything from how to properly kill a god in the fantasy universe to how uh, schadenfreude works in medieval texts, which the short version is if you stick a wolf's balls to an ice frozen lake, that is comedy gold. Speaking of frozen lakes, we are going to be discussing the long and painful and all too frozen career of perhaps the least successful dictator in human history, Alexander Kolchak, who made only good decisions all of the time. And welcome to World History with Charlie. The word aristocratic has weight to it, and with that weight comes connotations. For me, personally, the word aristocratic has connotations of a certain cynicism, a bit of worldliness to it as well, but moreover there's a subtle hint of disdain for the well-being of your economic inferiors. The sort of, an aristocrat would say, life is cheap to your kind and mean it, as opposed to it being a reference to God knows how many movies. The reason why we're focusing on the word aristocratic in this opening is because I think it's quite possibly my favorite and most accurate descriptor of the person we're going to be talking about. The person we're going to be talking about is Alexander Kolchak of the Russian White Army and failed one-year dictator of Siberia right after World War I. Here's the stage when Alexander Kolchak comes to power. Russia has just forcibly removed itself from World War I. In doing so, it ceded a lot of lands to Germany. This naturally did not please a lot of people, but it made the Germans very happy. And I'm not sure if you've heard of this. You know, this group called the Bolsheviks came in, overthrew the Kerensky government. It was a whole thing. Communists, basically. The, the very far left, in air quotes, wing of the Communist Party. And the natural reaction to that is for the landed gentry, the aristocracy, the priests, the rich investors, the 1% of the Russian Empire got really angry at this idea and said, we'll make our own government with blackjack and hookers and definitely restore the Russian Empire to glory. If they, if they were alive now, they'd be wearing red hats with make the Russian Empire great again thing. They're not nice people. They're the economic elite of Russia. They want to set the clock back. Alexander Kolchak was born to a rich family, uh, was a career military man, and served in World War I. He was a naval officer, a specialist in naval mines, which are a very good metaphor for Kolchak. Uh, as you know, most mines are not known for their mobility. They sit there, and then when something kicks them, they explode and preferably distribute the thing that kicked them over a 200-yard radius up, down, and sideways. Alexander Kolchak had a temper. Uh, one of my favorite historians describes Kolchak as short, humorless, and snappish. Sounds more like a Jack Russell Terrier than a person. And why we're fo focusing on Kolchak right now is that he is the embodiment of the aristocratic ideal, at least as the White Army saw it. The White Army had a provisional government that was nominally democratic, set up, and Kolchak, whose opinions on democracy are less than enlightened, launches a coup in late 1918 to set him up, himself up as the, the sovereign leader of all the Russias. And, unusually, going against all trends that would follow, Kolchak succeeds in his coup. He would not have a record of success after the coup. Now here's what Alexander Kolchak got as a result of this power grab. He got an empire that is basically all of Siberia. Siberia is all of Russia east of the Ural Mountains. Most specifically, it's thinly populated but very rich in resources. 
he got the Trans-Siberian Railway, which, again, runs from the Ural Mountains all the way past Lake Baikal on the border of Mongolia to Vladivostok in the east and the Pacific Ocean. Kolchak's little empire was almost entirely around the train lines. This train line was the reason the White Army had anything in Siberia. Now, you know, who hasn't laid awake and thinking, man, if I launched a coup that got me 90% of Russia, I know what I'd do with it. Come on, it's okay, there's no shame here. I've thought about it. I am convinced that a toddler would do better than what Kolchak did, because at the time he seized power in the White Army, the empire he took was filled to the brim with poison pills. It looks like a good idea, but it's not. He had a number of things working against him. For one thing, his allies were almost as bad as his enemies. First of all, you have a bunch of Czechoslovakian war prisoners, officers, and enlisted men who, the Second World War I ended, seized a bunch of Russian trains, made them into mobile cities and fortresses, you know, set them up with machine guns, gave them armor, and just rolled up and down the Trans-Siberian Railway, making a tiny little Czechoslovakia in the middle of Siberia. They fought the Red Army, the Bolsheviks, they fought the White Army, and they fought bandits. You know, they gave the middle finger to everyone. They're great. But you'd think that Kolchak would want to get in good with this weird, chaotic force, because at least that guarantees they don't sack your train lines, which are the things that keep your empire alive. Nope! He hated them because they weren't aristocrats, and they hated him because they thought, not without reason, that he was a hidebound reactionary who would probably have them all shot if he could. So no, no love there. Second element, and we're still on Kolchak's side, I should point out. These are the people he should be friends with. We haven't even gotten to his enemies. Second are the social revolutionaries. You might think of them as uh, people who have far left economic and social policies. Representative democracy, um, land reform, big Russian issue, always has been a big Russian issue, especially Siberian. Um, basically everyone who wanted a democracy but wasn't a Bolshevik and wasn't a white army enthusiast, as we should put it. So the social revolutionaries didn't like Kolchak, because again, he's an aristocratic snob, and he thinks they're the common rabble that if he had a gas chamber, he'd put them in it. Yes, the Nazi uh, comparison is actually fairly apt, considering what we're about to get to, which is the Cossacks. You want to make a situation worse? Add Cossacks. It's just a bad idea. Cossacks, for those of you who don't know, are the Slavic world's equivalent of cowboys, but they were used in part to spread Russia across Siberia in the early 15th and 16th centuries um, and are still a major cultural presence in Ukraine. Uh, the Cossacks that the White Army hired, hired is, are problematic. Let's put it that way. Uh, for them, uh, genocide wasn't a term. It was a way of life. They just liked rolling up into random Siberian villages, raping all the women, burning all the houses, and either conscripting or shooting all the men. And they just call it a day, and then just after the fact, yes, we have killed X many Bolsheviks. Yeah, see, retroactively naming the people who killed Bolsheviks doesn't make it true. These people haven't even heard of Bolsheviks. That's a Russian East Coast phenomena, or West Coast phenomena, that hasn't had time to reach Siberia. And as a result, you have a giant drag on your credibility, because the survivors of shit like this say, well, I don't know what a Bolshevik is, but I hate these white army Cossack fucks, and I'm going to make them pay. Sign me up. I'm a Bolshevik now. You know, kind of a problem. And here's the last fatal problem. These are his assets. These are Kolchak's assets in the Russian Civil Wars. Is that he is heavily funded by the Allied powers. The Allied powers at this time are France, uh, Japan is definitely in there, and America. We're going to get to Britain in a minute. Japan likes to hire Kolchak's Cossacks, Semyonov and Kalmakov, uh, to go and commit some war crimes so that the Japanese have a justification to come in and restore order and sort of 
half inch by half inch, expand their mainland empire. So the Japanese were not dealing in good faith in this situation. The English, in particular, uh, like to give Kolchak, Kolchak lots of guns and lots of money and lots of uniforms. This Kolchak was a very cultured man, worked against him, spoke English perfectly, had been to England. Uh, but this gave him a bit of a problem. You see, he was ho so heavily financed by the English, and the English doubtless had an idea of install Kolchak as a puppet dictator and rule Russia through him, not without merit, that Kolchak's government was mockingly called the Knox government behind his back, Knox being the lead British general on the ground in Siberia. So you have a major legitimacy problem right out the bat if, you just, if everyone else just thinks you're a, a foreign pawn. America is here too, because we were everywhere. We we're always everywhere, it's very annoying. Anyway, and unlike the French, the Japanese, and the English, we had sworn to keep the Trans-Siberian Railroad safe and not to meddle in Russian affairs, uh, which is a little bit hard when the Trans-Siberian Railroad only benefits and is run by Kolchak. It's like, we're not taking sides, except for where we're kind of taking sides, shit. Um, there are multiple accounts of American soldiers uh, begging not to be sent out on patrol um, because, in the words of one officer, don't send me out there again. If you send me out there again, I'm going to take off my uniform, but take my gun and go fight with these people. Meaning, fighting on behalf of the Siberians against the White Army. There's a high degree of discontent with Kolchak's and his military's behavior. Uh, Graves, the American general whose diary we have, uh, put it this way. This is what Kolchak would define as his government. This is Graves speaking now. Admiral Kolchak surrounded himself with former czarist officials, and because those peasants would not take up arms and offer their lives to put these people back in power, they were kicked, beaten with knouts, which is a sort of short, heavy whip, and murdered in cold blood by the thousands, and the world called them Bolsheviks. In Siberia, the word Bolshevik meant a human being who did not, by act and word, give encouragement to the restoration, to the restoration of power of, representative, of representatives of autocracy in Russia. By, by being not white army, you are by definition Bolshevik and therefore shootable. You're doing real good there, buddy. Make it everyone like you, Kolchak. Nice job. As you can imagine, an empire that is built on these very shaky foundations, the foreign interference, murders, hench people, uh, social revolutionaries, people who have actual ideas for government, and a random bunch of Mad Max Czechoslovakians, is not going to last long. And it doesn't. All those people who survived the initial massacres in Siberia link up with the Red Army, which has finally gotten its act together and started to come over the Urals, and the tide turns against Kolchak in a big way. He hops on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. He's trying to get out of Dodge, as it were. And unfortunately for him, his attempt to get out of Dodge, ah, he met a friend along the way on the, on the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad. It's our good friends, the Czechs on trains, the Czechoslovak Legion. And I imagine the conversation went something like this. So Kolchak, uh, what you got there? Oh, nothing, nothing important. Just, you know, the entire white army treasury and myself. Oh, oh, that's very interesting. Those sound really valuable. We're rerouting your train under a mountain. Stay there. The Czechoslovak Legion then opens up negotiations with the social revolutionaries back in Irkutsk, Kolchak's one-time capital, and they make a deal. All of Kolchak's treasury plus Kolchak equals the Czechoslovak region gets, the ride, gets to ride the rails all the way down to Vladivostok, and then from there go all around Eurasia and Africa to get back to Czechoslovakia. Kolchak's life and money for their freedom is the deal. Social, social revolutionaries like, yes, we absolutely hate that guy, and we also like money, so deal it is.
if things had been going badly for Kolchak before, they couldn't have gotten worse. He is taken to Irkutsk and duly tortured, as he would have very likely done to anyone who fell into his hands, and scheduled for execution, and very quickly. Uh, there was some talk of a white army counteroffensive rescuing him, which would be very bad for everyone involved in his torture. And before we get to the terminal moment of Kolchak's life, I would like to encourage you to take a moment to pause. It is very easy to take an aristocratic sense of satisfaction from Kolchak's swift execution at the hand of, hands of the social revolutionaries. But that would also to be to indulge in the very thing that damned Kolchak's government, which is more or less sadism. We uncovered a large trove of Kolchak's personal correspondence recently, um, bought up from a French collector and transferred to a museum in Russia. And, thanks to the internet, some of the contents of those letters were leaked. The letters are to his wife and son, and they're in English, which is a real boon for someone like me who doesn't speak Russian. And the portrait they paint of Kolchak during his one year, his last year, of dictatorship is that of a profoundly isolated and confused man who doesn't understand why people won't just give him what he's accustomed to. One incident in particular is Kolchak writing to his wife saying something along the lines of, I can find no human companionship I enjoy, so I have went and purchased a kitten to keep me company while I work late at night. That way something alive will show some appreciation. It's hard not to empathize with that sort of sentiment, even if Kolchak was an utter monster and way out of his league to, uh, to boot. Anyway, my point is not to take satisfaction from the fact that Kolchak was taken down to the Irkutsk River along with the second in command and shot in the back of the head, then tipped into the Yenisei to be forgotten. Thanks very much.